Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. I'm your host for this show. Uh, if you, this is your first time tuning in, welcome and thank you very much for taking the time to watch my show. If you're a returning YouTube viewer, thank you very much. I appreciate that as well and hopefully you're subscribed. If you follow my show or even if you don't, uh, I do this relatively unscripted. I look at kind of the weekly or within the time period that I do these shows, uh, news topics and stories that are going on in this EV marketplace and the EV revolution that we're experiencing and I talk about them. So I have a few stories that we'll talk about today mainly really from auto manufacturers it's been an exciting few days a lot of stuff have, has happened and uh, let me get right into it now first thing i just want to mention before i get into the individual uh, some uh, news from individual auto manufacturers is really the global outlook for january uh, you've heard me and other uh, YouTubers that uh, cover the EV industry talk about the acceleration in EV sales, and that is continuing on, which is a bright spot, continuing on for 2019, that the EV market share for the month globally was at 1.9%, which is just under the 2%, very slightly under the 2% that we've had at the end of last year. Um, even And that's despite battery constraints um, issues, which we start to see cropping up from various manufacturers, of course, and I've talked about those on other shows. 100, uh, almost 154,000 EVs sold globally. And this is according to EV sales blog. So, um, and within that number, a whopping 72% of EVs were actually all electric or battery electric vehicles. A majority percentage of, of quite a wide majority percentage of vehicles being purchased that are battery, all battery electric. And that just makes sense because there's more product coming out, more longer ranges, more infrastructure, a lot of things to continue to uh, spur EV adoption globally. Um, you'll see that um, the Chinese, of course, continue to, to flourish within their market space. And I don't really comment a lot about the Chinese manufacturers. A lot of them actually looking to uh, divest into more global markets. Uh, I talked about GIAC, I believe, as an example in my Detroit show episode where they were trying to penetrate the North American market. So you can see the top couple of brands are uh, from the Chinese manufacturers. Then, of course, Nissan still held a respectable number and the Model 3 was a little slow, uh, but I fully expect that to, to quantum shift in the next couple of months. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. It's because Tesla was ramping up for European and China deliveries. So there was a bit of a, a, a production uh, slowdown or, or not so much slowdown, but just more inventorying of vehicles, getting them on boats and shipping them across the areas before they start the floodgates open this month, uh, being now March when I'm recording the show. So all good news. Uh, again, you know, when you're talking to people, just continue to outline the various models that are out there and the choice that they have and that the industry is doing really well. Right, like, let's get to one of the top stories for this week, and which is the Tesla Model 3 finally, finally coming out with the base version, that $35,000 US version that they've been talking about since March 31st, 2016, when they revealed the Model 3 and got so many people excited about that model. They finally come out with it. So it has a shorter range. And if I have some of the specs here, the standard model comes out with 220 miles of range, which is about 354 kilometers. Uh, I won't read top speeds in zero to 60s because, I mean, there's not very many places in the world that you can do these top speeds legally. So, you know, all the power to you if you want to try them. But you can get all the specs from websites. Uh, but at 35,000, that's a really nice, comfortable range to be at. Again, it's in with, with various other competitors that are in that market space. Um, now, they've also come out with a standard range plus, And what that does is give you a slight boost in the range to 386 kilometers or 240 miles. So about another 20 miles or so. And it gives you a couple of other different uh, choices and incentives for paying a little bit more for that model. You get a little bit upgraded interior and so forth. And I won't go into a ton of the specs because... You can look all that stuff up online. What I wanted to report, and that one is 37000 before incentive. So a couple of grand more, you get a little bit more range and some more internal uh, specs with that, so a nicer interior. Now, the other news associated with the, the launch of the uh, availability of the $35,000 Model 3 is that um, the Tesla is also going to shift their sales focus. And this makes perfect sense for them, really, when you, when you look at it. Um, they've always been in more of an online model anyway, even though they have what quote unquote retail stores and galleries, 
a lot of those have turned into really just people kind of coming in to talk to people and look at things but a lot of the transactions happen more at their traditional service centers where they have typically more product easier to get in and out of to to take one for a test drive and so forth and those are starting to expand more and more and then also for tesla to sell into some of the states they weren't able to actually because of some of the state mandates and laws that are there uh, regarding uh, dealerships and and they've they've had some issues in trying to get in some of that u.s marketplace so they've been only able to sell online so moving to a more shifting sales to an online model and just you know getting rid of a lot of those stores those malls and things like that makes sense for them certainly financial sense because uh, what they can do is shift some of that manpower from direct sales staff and 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 store type of people uh, to more of a manufacturing because they need to increase manufacturing open they're going to open more plants and so forth you know china's they're going to start building uh within the next little bit and so forth get into more engineering and get into and of course growing the support staff you know because that's going to go through the roof now with all these continued sales for them so shifting that uh is going to be much more cost effective for them and it makes perfect sense um, there's some stats about how much savings that they'll they'll need to achieve the 30 to keep the gross margins going very strong in the thirty five thousand dollar model three because we know that those margins are, going to, are a lot less than than the higher range models and the higher price models so it, it, they're going to keep some of the high traffic locations going uh, turn them into more galleries and information centers but that most of the ordering all the ordering will be done online and of course they're going to spool up more service centers and increase their ranger road network so basically they want to transform their service model more into will come to you aspect versus you having to go into a service center especially for uh, the majority of, of their issue seem to be more minor in nature you know it's very rare that you that you hear about a you know a, a really catastrophic failure in a in a model in a tesla per se um, that's not accident related you know road accident or, or whatever related so most of their um, issues can be fixed by somebody coming you know to your driveway and, and doing some repairs if it's body work and things like that then obviously they'll coordinate where you would need to go so it makes perfect sense for them to do all that stuff and they're, they're going to try to trim their service levels down to a same day even service level if they can do it and they're gonna, certainly going to put more feet on the street and expand that and they've offer to expand this in countries where they sell so this isn't going to be just a u.s they're going to offer this in the uk offer this in europe in china and all the other countries that they sell they're going to expand these networks to be able to really grow their um uh their sales uh, from that aspect um so all good news on the the model three i was looking at some of the canadian pricing and it's about when you look at the standard range model um, it comes in uh, at about $58,000. So if I take that from an Ontario, this is an Ontario price. If I take that, add in my freight and destination, add in my taxes, it's about $58,000 because we have zero incentives here, folks. In Ontario, unfortunately, we don't have our $14,000 or anything at this point. So that is the price that you would pay off the lot basically without any money down or any trade-ins or anything if you were just to walk in and buy it about fifty eight thousand dollars canadian for the base model three and again that that puts it into a price range which is comparable to others um, I, I don't have pricing yet on the nissan leaf e plus as an example but certainly from a chevy bolt perspective um, at that price it's very similar price point with that similar range uh, of course they are different cars for many reasons so congratulations on tesla to finally get the the $35,000 model 3 it's going to do phenomenally well now i've been reading some some reports and some posts and websites over the last couple of days since this came out especially over the last day and you know everybody's saying this is going to be kind of the end of a lot of the other ev manufacturers that it's a tipping point for for tesla to really just go after and consume the market and I keep saying I don't think so. And the reason, folks, and I'll just uh, quickly explain this, is because it's a huge market. Uh, re remember, I just talked about global numbers being 1.92%. That means 98% of the global automobile market is up for grabs from an EV versus ICE uh, battle. Now, take away some of the uh, consumer vehicles, like maybe you know pickup trucks and light trucks that don't have really offerings today. Uh, and you're left with still a, a sizable market for everybody to go after, which means that there's a lot of the pie that can be spread around to the lot of the other man, auto manufacturers. So even if Tesla starts selling a million cars a year, 
there's still room for everybody else to grow and flourish in this marketplace. We need everybody to be selling millions of cars a year, EVs that is, to, to, to make the impact in that marketplace that we need done to, to, to dramatically help with shifting climate change to a better element to you know to lowering the greenhouse gas emissions and so forth so you've got to look at things from that scale and and i know that tesla is going to do well but i don't think that they're going to impact everybody else in the marketplace because nissan's carved out their niche audi's going to be quite happy with whatever they can deliver even though they're constrained mercedes and so forth i'll talk about mercedes in a bit all these other manufacturers you know some of them have production constraint delays now so they're going to be they're starting at zero they'll be happy to deliver whatever they can and so forth so there's lots of room for everybody to play so remember that when you're when you're talking about evs not everybody wants to buy a Tesla. It's a great choice. And if you can afford it, if you budget, if your lifestyle, if, if the car works for you, then great. But when you're out talking to people, because part of, again, what I do is to try to help educate people that don't have EVs to try to get those proverbial, quote unquote, you know, bums in seats kind of aspect. We want to get people shifting away from tailpipes into zero emission vehicles. And the more choice out there, the better. So when you're out talking to them, you know, talk about pros and cons of the different models. Look at what's right for that particular person's or person's use cases and then give them the options. You know, there, there's pros and cons with any any vehicle. So congratulations again, Tesla, and I wish them all the best. And we will definitely be seeing some large numbers out of them in the coming months. Well, the next big announcement that I'm so excited for and kind of Probably the main focus of this show, even though it's only one story of a few that I have today, is Polestar's reveal that they came out with the live stream event they had a couple of days ago for their all-electric new Polestar 2 sedan. I am super stoked about this. Now, I don't think this is going to obviously sell as many as Tesla uh, of the Model 3, even though they've directly referenced the Model 3 as a competitor to this vehicle. And they've done that. To, to position the vehicle. So they've said that this is a premium electric vehicle sedan. This is a premium model. This, you know, that's how they're positioning. That's what Tesla is, a premium brand. So they are trying to equate themselves to that sort of luxury and premium price point of what you get. And I think the Polestar 2 is enough of a differentiator to do that. They've come out with some, you know, and I've got some video and stuff running as I'm commenting here and some pictures. This all new electric fastback. Yes, it does have a hatch, which is pretty cool. Um, it's going to start at about 39.9 euros. And if I do use some conversion rates, that's about 63K US or 69.9 Canadian. Probably the pricing will be slightly lower because typically the, the conversions that I look at go online and just do a daily converter. They're, they're going to be better than that. Um, and the top of the line model will be just under 60,000 euros, uh, which is, um, sorry, the, the 60,000 euros is about 63K uh, US or 69.9 Canadian. The base model at 40,000 euros just under is about 45K USD uh, and obviously slightly higher in Canadian numbers again. So those numbers are going to be there. So it does put it in competition with, you know, the higher end model three models and so forth. Now, what you're going to get for that is two electric motors. So it's an all wheel drive vehicle with 78 kilowatt hour battery capacity. Very handsome indeed with, a, with an estimated range of about 500 kilometers. That's a WLTP range. So EPA, they're claiming about 442 miles, sorry, 442 kilometers or 275 miles, which is very respectable for that type of price point in size. It's uh, the battery is made up of 27 modules. Each module has uh, 12 cells. So that gives you a total of 324 cells. As I look at my notes here, these are uh, pouch styled cells. Now, I don't believe they mentioned who their manufacturer is for the um, battery cells. So if somebody knows that. Put it in the comments or send me an email um, and I can put it in the comments for you. But uh, their battery design is fairly standard. You know, it's going to fit under underneath uh, between the axles on the floor, of course, take up some space that would be normally be, be dead space there. Um, the cooling will be a, via a flat plate cooling system. So similar to the Bolt and some others that use that. So they will have active thermal management within that configuration from a power 
production, um, the vehicle will give out 300 kilowatts of power or 408 horsepower or 660 newton meters of uh, torque or 487 foot pounds or sorry, pound feet of torque if you into those measurements with a zero to 100, zero to 62 in about five seconds or so. Very respectable numbers. They'll also offer a performance version, which is the version they're going to start shipping first, the higher one at just under 60,000 euros to start. And that performance pack will have uh, Olin dampers. It will have improved driving dynamics. It will come with Brembo brakes, 20-inch uh, unique forged wheels, and so on and so on and so on. All, all kinds of these other nice little visual things and, and interior touches. Uh, so the technology, they one thing I liked about the Polestar announcement, I have to admit watching this was very informative. It was really nicely done. So they focused a lot, even before they got to, to really get into the car specs, they talked about safety, and that was kind of one of their first things. Now, Elon's done something similar. Of course, when he revealed the Model 3, he was talking about five-star safety ratings. He's very much safety conscious. Well, so is Polestar, which is a part of Volvo, and Volvos are always known to be tanks and to be very safe vehicles that they offer. And this vehicle would be no exception. They talked about, you know, the rigidity and the structure of the battery and some crumple zones and showed some animations and so forth, which is very helpful for, for new type people, first timers looking at battery electric, not realizing that inherent, inherently that skateboard platform just gives you those attributes, right? It gives you those safety attributes of higher, you know, a little more rigidity and so forth and, and protection in, in certain crashes. Their, their infotainment and their, I really loved their interior. It was a very simplified yet very functional. Um, so not overly simple like a Model 3 and not overly button related like maybe a Mercedes or a BMW or whatever that has a lot of uh, of stuff in there. This was very, very well laid out and very practical. They're using an, uh, an infotainment system powered by Android, offering Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Play Store. It's an 11 inch touch screen that's set in a portrait mode type of fashion. Um, they're using one thing they're kind of taking from Tesla. <laughs> Again, you know, the best form of flattery is to copy somebody, so why not? So they're using the smartphone key fob integration as well so that you'll be able to, it'll detect your proximity as you approach the car and unlock the doors when you touch them and so forth with these kind of things. So I'm not 100% sold on that. I'd rather still have some sort of backup key fob, but hey, you know, if that's what they want to go with, great. Um, so that's all cool stuff. They uh, have smart features like enlarged graphics in the binnacle, the instrumentation cluster, which with maps and all this kind of stuff. Really nice, uh, you know, the instrumentation as you can see, looks really, really well. And one of the, the neat thing I caught from the presentation is that they don't have a push button start. Uh, the car will actually start when you sit. There's a sensor in the seat. When you get in the driver's seat, you have your phone. You've all been you've been checked out by the car, so to speak. You sit down in the seat, and it will start. I guess it's knowing that you're going to want to go for a drive. So if you want to just activate the accessories, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I'm sure we'll find out later on. There are probably a menu setting for that. Uh, one thing to help with. Um, with people that are concerned about the environment and about leather and things like that is that they will have, uh, they design with a standard vegan interiors uh, with different textiles as well. Some really neat ones, some that are similar to wetsuits and all this kind of stuff. So very durable. They had, one of the other things that they, they talked about being new was these Pixel LED headlights. And these are headlights that have some smart technology that can, along with sensors that can detect oncoming traffic and um, shut off certain portions of the LED strip lights so that lights don't shine in the oncoming vehicles. And what they said basically is that you could, you could drive with the high beams on all the time. And these headlights would constantly adapt to the traffic situations to give you the most light that's allowable in that, in that circumstance without blinding oncoming traffic and so forth. And, and the guy in front of you. So pretty cool. I'll have to wait and see how that works. Now, that doesn't seem to be uh, an option that's going to be available for the North American markets. It seems like it's just going to be a European uh, market uh, option for now, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but that's pretty cool anyway. One other thing I liked about it was the side mirrors. Now, they're they went away from this camera stuff, which is which is good because we won't get camera based systems here in North America. It's just not going to happen anytime soon. It might might you know they can roll out in Europe and other countries, but not here. But they've got the actual so instead of the glass in the side mirror tilting as you normally would have in a power mirror, the actual mirror itself is on a pivot mechanism and is on a joint, and that turns. So the glass remains stable. It's the mirror housing itself that turns. And what they've been able to do because of that is shrink. 
the housing size down a bit give you the same relatively mirror space and operates a little better so that's that's just out of the box thinking i thought that that was pretty cool and i, and I believe they brought that out in their polestar one uh, uh vehicle concept as well when they talked about that um, so that's basically most of the specs for this car that I've captured. Uh, now you can go, if you want to jump online to Polestar.com and go pre-order. They're taking pre-orders now. Now production won't begin till early part of next year in 2020, the magical year that I've been talking about for a while. They're going to be all produced in China and in assembly lines there, and but they are going to be shipping to global markets. And they're going to produce left and right hand drive uh, vehicles to start. So right away they're going to come out with both versions for the markets uh, that are applicable. Uh, first public appearance will be at the in a couple of weeks in Geneva at the International Auto Show, and then they'll, they'll do a global road show. One other thing I found interesting is that the initial market launch will be China, the United States, Canada, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the UK. All hotspots for EV adoption. I'm sorry for other countries that are not on the list. Australia, New Zealand, you guys are waiting still for Tesla in a lot of cases. I, you know, I know for the Model 3, I know that eventually they'll get there with these as well. But unfortunately, that's what they're talking about. Other markets will be expanded as they go, which probably means it won't be for a little while. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's some of the specs. And uh, they are going, going to actually look at expanding their product portfolio with another model called the Polestar 3, which will be a fully electric SUV. No surprise about getting into the SUV game. But for now, the Polestar 2 is out. It's uh, You can reserve it, and I would encourage you to check it out. I feel really, really good about these guys. I mean, Volvo, again, build quality is super, super good. They've always been very, uh, very reliable and very uh, well-built vehicles, and I don't expect the Polestar to be anything less but that. Um, I don't think it's going to lead worldwide sales figures when it comes out. I think the price point is at that premium market space. They're not trying to compete with the entry level Model 3 by the looks of it. Not at you know 30, uh, not at 40,000 euro pricing already. It's going to be higher than the base three, but you know it will give you more. So again, choice is good for consumers, and the more choice, the better to continue to grow EV adoption. So best of luck to Polestar. Some other announcements. Uh, there's a whole whack of stuff that came out on the Honda E prototype. Some leaked pictures and some announcements from Honda. And then my, my good friends at Fully Charged did a really nice episode uh, over the last couple of days that they got some exclusive access to the Honda E prototype, uh, which you're going to start seeing behind me if you're not in front of me already. Um, the cool thing about this, and, and no, I was a little. Uh, mixed about it at first when I saw it and read the specs. You know, it's a it's a five door. It doesn't look like it, but there are hidden door handles in the uh, C pillars there. It's a five door subcompact. Will come out with uh, about a hundred and twenty five mile range. So when I read that, I'm going, oh, that's a little disappointing, I guess, because kind of one fifty and almost two hundred now is kind of the entry level for EVs or at least all electric battery vehicles that we think of. But you know, Honda. As I watch a video and listen to the interview and read some more materials, you know, Honda is, is out there saying, look, we built this for urban applications. So that's why we're coming up with this kind of, because that's what we feel is the best, you know, this is the best kind of sized vehicle, it is nimble, it's big enough for four people, it's a, it's a four person, it's not a five seater, almost a two plus two kind of model. Uh, but it does have, of course, the rear, the the doors for the back seats. It's a five doors, got a hatchback model. Um, so the more I read about that, the more it kind of makes sense, and I understand where Honda is going with that. Um, it was interesting as well that the concept that that I've shown on this show and that you've seen and, and we've talked about before is actually something they came up with after the production prototype. So they actually took the car to a production prototype phase and then built the concept to go show around. And what they did because of that is they got ideas and they got suggestions from people that were looking at the concept and, and you know, I like this or I don't like this about it and so forth. And they were able to, to probably take that information to tweak the final production prototype that we've seen because the production prototype, according to, to Johnny at Fully Charged Live while he was doing this, is a very solidly built car. It's it's pretty well almost ready to roll off the assembly line. And that was confirmed because this vehicle is about 95% production ready. So that's really close. There's not a whole heck of a lot that they can do. 
which is pretty cool. So be it that it only has 125 miles and this is WLTP rating, so EPA might be slightly less. Um, uh, no, no specs as far as, um, uh, you know, if that range will be offered in different packages or not. I think they're going to come out with this single package and this single type of, of effort to start with and then, you know, grow it from there because there were questions asked about other models and so forth. This is their first take at really a pure electric vehicle. Um, some of the cool things, of course, if you look at the body and you look at the video that's going on, it's, I, I do like the design. It's really grown on me. I think a lot of the elements are very pleasing. It's got a nice urban design. Pop-out door handles. This one has camera side mirrors, of course, for the North American market. We won't get that. Um, See-through front fascia to show charging status. Um, the cabin is pretty neat with that kind of wood, even though it's a laminate or it's, a, it's not a real wood kind of trim. It looks pretty, pretty zen-like, you know, pretty calming, and I do like that. Uh, again, it's a four-seater. They did say that the battery cells are from Panasonic, which would mean that they're cylindrical batteries they're using. It's a rear-wheel drive, so like the i3. They wanted to keep it to a rear-wheel experience uh, from an ability, from a mobility aspect in getting in and out of traffic, and Honda is very good at, at doing that. Uh, they have a lot of history there. So that makes sense. CCS uh, combo charging from a fast charging uh, uh, viewpoint. Um, urban centric as i mentioned they're going to start production again with l uh, left hand drive and uh, right hand drive vehicles they're all going to be built in japan i don't know what plant but that uh, either one plant or multiple plants in japan they're going to start production this year and they they said that they actually plan on hoping to make deliveries before the end of this year in some markets um, and if you look at the car, it does have a long, it a, has a long wheelbase relative to the size of the vehicle. So there's not a lot of overhang. They're very short from the wheels. So if you look at the outside of the four wheels, there's not a lot of overhang that continues on there. So they've maximized the interior room as much as possible to keep that in that shorter framework of a, of a, of a chassis and of, of a bodywork. So um, there's a lot of other details that, that you can pick up from the video. So I encourage you to check out my friends at Fully Charged Live, at Fully Charged and watch that video go check it out it's about 30 minutes a great video johnny did a fantastic job and there's a lot of good information and you know my report's not going to do it all fully justice but you know I, i'm very very glad to see honda finally jump into the game we need toyota now as one of the other big guys to wisen up and get into the full electric only uh, uh, uh viewpoint and to start producing some cars but um very very good on honda uh, I, i'm very pleased with this vehicle uh there i don't believe there was a price point mentioned because i don't have anything in my notes um I, I do expect this to be a little bit on the pricey side for what you get as far as range but until that is confirmed we'll have to wait and see uh, so continue to follow the honda and let me know what your thoughts what do you think of this vehicle do you like it do you not what what specs are interested to you and what would you like to see from honda for from a future where would you like to see them go from this i'd love to hear your viewpoints a couple other quick manufacturer stories audi there's been another uh, all this winter testing going on and these guys with their cameras spying on they must they must know where these guys go in germany or sweden or whatever it is i think it's sweden or norway um so a new sportback version of the e-tron has been spied winter testing a couple of pictures up here um it's really should have about the same specs as the current e-tron 95 kilowatt hour battery pack uh, 310 miles of any dc so 250 ish range or so 240 range 300 kilo, uh, 70 kilowatts of power dual motor all this kind of stuff but a little bit different configuration than the e-tron suv this is the sport back version as you can see in these couple of pictures um, as more information comes out they are talking about uh, starting to produce these this calendar year in 2019 by the end of it they're all going to be built in uh, the same uh, model uh, line as the current e-tron today in the brussels belgium uh, I fully expect these when they come out to be under allocation as Audi is having some constraint issues. But uh, it's nice to see Audi continuing to move forward with their uh, all electric battery uh, vehicle plans. Staying in Europe, I wanted to talk about these leaked images that came out of the Peugeot uh, E208. This is an all-electric car. We don't get these in North America, the Peugeot, but very popular in, in many parts of Europe. Um, they, they're going to actually unveil it and uh, do a big splash at the upcoming Geneva Motor Show in a couple of weeks. But it's reportedly to have the same powertrain and batteries as the DS3 Crossback e tents which is a vehicle I don't know anything about. But it's scheduled to come out in the second half of 2019 of this year. 
It should have, they're estimating about a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack. And in this form factor size, that seems to be pretty good to give it up to about 300 kilometers or 186 miles of range. And that's under LT, WLTP. So maybe closer to that 160 mile, 150 plus mile club range. We'll have to wait and see. Which again, for urban and for Europe, for a lot of you know, inner city and, and you know, small cross, cross, small, uh, cross country commutes from that aspect, this would make sense. Um, we'll have to wait and see. One of the things uh, I, I mentioned Geneva a couple times already in this show, um, it's, it's looking to be the world's probably biggest electric car debut venue uh, up to date. So there was a lot of stuff happened at the LA Auto Show, some great announcements at CES. Uh, Paris is always a good one, but this Geneva one seems to be the one that's really going to be centered probably more around electric vehicles than the internal combustion vehicles. And if that happens, that's that's a really big deal, folks. That's a mind shift, right? I mean, I reported about Detroit being the opposite, where I had to go digging around to find an EV. Toronto had a pretty good balance uh, approach of here. Uh, the word is, is that in Geneva, that could be the other way around. There could be more EVs and more splash and more noise about EVs then on gas diesels debuts and and vehicles so that's excellent news if that happens uh, anybody going there uh, I'm sure there's gonna be loads of reports coming from Geneva in a couple of weeks but that that's good news and it just shows you that the the tides are turning ever so slowly quickly back to the spy testing there's some uh, shots of the the BMW i next this is their electric SUV that was spy testing now if you look at the the prototype that came out this picture here behind me it, it this one that they've seen testing really doesn't look a whole lot like that uh, it's got you know a completely different kind of b pillar uh, or it's got a b pillar in it the side mirrors are your standard you know wing mount mirror uh, mounted cameras and so forth or of course we'll have um, we'll have regular side mirrors here in North America uh, different headlights and so forth so it's, it does have a different look but the, the, a lot of the base uh, I guess look and feel from the concept is still built into this now there's not a lot of specs that come from this this is BMW's um, this is their fifth generation drive system that they're going to develop for this with, with long range all wheel uh, drive EVs uh, which will be comparable to the, I, uh, the iX3 that they're using in there and the i4 that I talked about for 2020 no other specs on that and as we get as I get more information I'll certainly report on it but again you know it's great to see more of this stuff happening and when you do start seeing spy shots you see these vehicles out in the wild that means they're not too far away from production they're working out kinks and they've actually got a pretty good sense of where they want to go with this platform and, and a lot of the the characteristics and and you know manufacturing things pretty well worked out so it's a good sign to start seeing this from bmw and my last automotive report today is i mentioned mercedes-benz earlier their eqc and i did a nice interview if you watch uh, i believe the second part of my last uh, episode about the toronto car show you'll see the a uh, little bit more in-depth analysis on the eqc well these things are selling really well even though it's a pretty expensive platform to look at but they're they were scheduling for a mid-market launch in this year it looks like there's just going to be a handful of cars uh, that are going to be available come the first part of uh, June or July of this year. Boy, that's similar though to the Model 3. When it came out, there was, what, 30 they did on the first delivery day? So that's that's a handful. I don't know if it'll just be 30 here for a Mercedes, but um, it should be probably a bit more than that, but maybe a whole not, whole not a lot more really um, we'll have to wait and see so the full ramp up for this isn't really expected to reach some sort of volume till around November December of this year and I've already heard about it really kind of selling out for the remainder of 2019 calendar year and they're already you know into looking at 2020 deliveries they've sold out pre-orders from last year and into this year that's what it looks like but again if everybody anybody is going in to, to put a pre-order in on an eqc and they get some information from their dealer please uh, send me an email or drop a comment and let me know what you hear because i'd like to always like to test you know what really is out there because media we get information but until you're a user that's actually putting money down looking for something then you'll get more substantial information than we may hear and again, you know, these constraints seem to be happening everywhere. Audi, as I just mentioned, is, is looking at is, uh, delays for their Audi e-tron by several months. 
we know the Kona situation, we know the Kia Nero situation, again, production delays and delays. And it's not uncommon as these latecomers to the EV marketplace are starting to spool up and work out factories and work out the kinks. It's going to take them a little bit to spool up production and to get things going. So give them a year or so to get all that ready. But I'm fully confident that they'll, they'll be pumping these things out in decent numbers. And again, decent numbers, I mean as numbers that they're happy with, not necessarily numbers to compare against Tesla or Nissan or GM or Hyundai or whoever. Whatever those manufacturers want to kick out, they're all going to be very happy with it. I know that the number for Canada, from what I've heard for the Mercedes, as an example, isn't going to be a very big number for, for numbers that are coming to Canada, or at least the the potential for there. You know, the allocation, they may only get several hundred. We'll have to wait and see. So, but but again, that's going from zero to something and that's all upswing for them and and that's good you know it's good that they're getting some some vehicles out here to get people out of uh, tailpipes and into all electric zero emission vehicles which is what we're all about all right well that takes me to the end of this episode episode i don't even remember what episode it was 33 i probably didn't even say that at the beginning wow time flies when i'm having fun i'll tell you trying to get these things out now one thing i wanted to mention is um here's a heads up and if you don't already know there's two events that are happening this year uh, one in the uk and one in the states and the first one is the fully charged uh 2.0 as i call it which is going to be back um, in the uk at silverstone going on from june 7th to june 9th of this year um you can if you haven't got tickets for that you should go check it out uh, i think tickets uh, for that event will be going on sale really soon I'll be out there. I'm looking forward to go visiting with my mates in the UK again and seeing a lot of friendly faces and seeing all the activity and the EV excitement that's going on in the UK, which represents a lot of the European theater. So I'm really excited to be out there for that. So if anybody's going to be out there that follows me, uh, please uh, come and say hi to me like you did last year. I had a, I was just, again, very extremely humbled by the amount of people that came and, and said hi and said they loved, loved, the, loved the work that I've been doing. So I really much appreciate that. And I love to talk to people, hear their stories, stories and, and listen to their excitement and, and answer questions. So I look forward to being out there. And as well, if you're not aware, Fully Charged is doing another event in the U.S. this year. So this will be a double whammy for them in the fall of uh, this year. The dates are now official. It's going to be September the 7th and the 8th of this year. It's going to be in Austin, Texas at the Circuit of the Americas uh, facility, which is a nice racetrack area. I don't have any more information to share on that, but what I would do is go check out the Fully Charged Live uh, YouTube website and, and all, their, all their websites and, and Facebook and all that stuff that they have and stay tuned for more information. I don't. I think tickets for that will start going on sale within about a month or so, uh, so I'm not 100% sure, but uh, go check out their site for announcements and for more information to follow. But again, I'll definitely be down for that event. I'm actually helping these guys uh, with some organization of the event and, and doing some things behind the scenes for them to give them a hand so i'm excited to be part of that uh, that family and to helping them out and i'll definitely be that uh, down at that event as well so if you can't get to the uk to see me uh, that'll be another event we'll be able to come up and say hi and shake some hands and hear some stories so i'm excited about that and that really takes me to the end of my show all my contact information everything will be coming up here momentarily i want to thank everybody for tuning in tried to get through this episode relatively as fast as i could but there was a there's been so much information this week i just tried to pick out some of the top stuff that i thought was uh, was of interest and i want to thank people that are contributing on patreon to helping me out because that means a lot that helps me to continue these shows so with all that said i believe that i'm the end i'm looking at my notes i think that's about it so i'll be looking to get another show out next week but until then please uh, reach out to me by email or comments if you like and you want to say something got some stories to, to share i'd love to hear oh and by the way my friends at the um rz uh the renault zoe club of uk that's where the shirt's from a shout out to craig and the team uh finally dug the shirt up that you gave me and thought i threw it on for this episode to promote you guys if you have a renault zoe and you love that card go check out these guys um, they are growing immensely check out the club support them they do lots of great things in the uk uh so uh, my hats again off to uh, craig and the team here but until next time everybody please stay safe and we'll see you next time and we'll see you later Bye bye